Today we have special guests um, who will be discussing gender equity and gender-based violence um, in the era of COVID-19. Thank you so much everyone for joining. My name is Janelle Williams and I serve as Director of Programs here at Global Health Action and we are honored um, to have both with us Lois Pace, who's the President and Executive Director of Global Health Council, and Lisa Munala, Dr. Lisa Munala, um, who's the Assistant Professor of Public Health at St. Catharines University. Global Health Action has been around for about 48 years, um, working in countries all over the world, over 97 countries, um, training, building capacity for over 9,000 plus uh, health, development, community, faith-based leaders. Um, and today, um, the series that we've uh, developed has really come from what we've been hearing on the ground from our partners in terms of some key areas of need, support, learning, information, collaboration, connection. And so we're happy to share with everyone that post this call, um, we will actually have the slides um, as well as the presentation uh, in video format available on our website. If you have not had a chance to go there, please certainly go and check us out at www.globalhealthaction.org. Um, and we look forward to hearing from you, seeing you, talking with you, and of course, sign up for our newsletter. So again, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. And without much further ado, I will introduce our guests. Today, um, we have Dr. Munala. Dr. Munala is an assistant professor in the Department of Public Health at St. Catharines University. She earned an MA in social work from the University of Chicago and her PhD in public health from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Her research interests are in exploring and addressing violence against women in East Africa, the development of policies and interventions for survivors of sexual violence, and improving the quality of post-rape care services. Dr. Munala, welcome today to our webinar series. We anticipate a great discussion Everyone, if you're in the chat room, please use the chat room for conversations, for questions, um, and we will certainly respond and have that time set up for the end of the presentations, an opportunity to share. Dr. Munala, welcome. Thank you so much, Janelle. Um, we will start with, um, I'll be talking about gender-based violence during the COVID-19 pandemic. And so we'll start with um, the definition. Um, so what is gender-based violence? Um, it's violence directed against a person due to their gender, and it's not exclusively a woman's concern. We know that both men and women experience gender-based violence, but we know that the majority of victims are women and girls. Gender-based violence against women and Gender-based violence and violence against women are terms that are often used interchangeably, as it's been widely acknowledged that most gender-based violence is inflicted on women and girls and perpetrated by men. What I like about this terminology is that it shifts the conversation and the focus from women merely as victims um, to gender and the unequal power relationships uh, between women and men. And these unequal relationships are created and maintained, you know, by gender stereotypes, as well as the basic underlying cause of violence against women. Next. And so we know that domestic violence was a global pandemic long before the COVID-19 outbreak but like other disasters is exacerbated during emergencies. So whether it's conflict, um, pandemic, or economic crises. Um, and gender-based violence exists in every society worldwide. 35% of women um, have experienced sexual or physical abuse by an intimate partner and or sexual assault by an intimate partner. We also know that the most dangerous place for women is in their home um, with about 58% 50, of all female homicides victims being killed by intimate partners um, or relatives. 
And during times like this, reporting and law enforcement mechanisms, as well as services for survivors, are often disrupted by disasters and emergencies. We're seeing um, traditional services to survivors in every sector being um, disrupted. And so, during a quick search of um, domestic gender-based violence as a whole, um, in the news, um, so many articles are popping up from different parts um, of the world. And so we know that this is, you know, it's, it's happening. And one of the things we have to look at is the emerging data um, demonstrates this evidence that the COVID-19 pandemic has a disproportionately negative effect impact on women and girls. And we know that quarantines as a whole are associated with increased incidence of gender-based violence and particularly intimate partner violence. And so again, just a few statistics. Um, in Argentina, the emergency 137 line for abuse victims um, has seen a 67% rise in calls for help in April compared to last year after a nationwide lockdown. We see 90% of causes of domestic violence related to the COVID-19 epidemic in China. Um, authorities in France reported more than 30% um, rise in domestic violence cases in the first week of the COVID-19 um, lockdown. Singapore, you know, reporting domestic violence up by 22% since COVID-19. In the UK, um, seeing domestic abuse almost double um, since the pandemic um, began. You see in Kenya, Director of Criminal Investigations noting a rise in domestic violence. So recognizing the extent to which the COVID-19 pandemic affects people and particularly at risk and marginalized groups in specific ways is fundamental um, to understanding the impacts of this health emergency. And we know from the previous slide um, that we, we have seen data from many regions already suggesting significant increases in domestic violence cases, and particularly among marginalized populations. So survivors of sexual violence um, and domestic violence are particularly vulnerable during extended periods of isolation, which is happening now with lockdowns. And the preventative measures to control the spread of COVID-19, such as shelter in place and travel restrictions are increasing gender-based violence risks and violence against women um, and related risks to violence against women. So many women have found themselves forced to spend more time with partners who might already have been abusive um, so with the potential to increase both the frequency and severity of the violence. And stay-at-home orders, which are great for stopping the spread of the pandemic, um, are limiting survivors' access to external support. As it's restricting access, as well as um, the ability for them to escape either violent partners um, or parents. Next. So some of the risk factors um, on during the pandemic um, for women and girls, um, thinking about dependency on income from the assailant um, during this time with a lot of job loss, um, and furloughs, um, difficulty finding private and safe times to reach out for support or call 911 um, while isolated with others. Having shelter in place makes it hard to travel for medical treatment, refuge, or mental health services. 
um, being separated from informal support such as religious community, you know, interaction with your coworkers or colleagues, as well as coping strategies, you know, coffee with friends or going to the gym. We also know that prevention strategies such, such as reducing visits to stores like grocery stores um, increases safety, um, may decrease the safety for women experiencing intimate partner violence who could have the opportunity to disclose abuse as well as seek um, support while they're out of the home. And we have seen um, layoffs in virtually every industry. And so having layoffs, increasing abusive partners' feelings of desperation, um, depression, and incompetence, which may increase attempts to exert power and control in the home. So we know that poverty is violence. Families living in poverty are more likely to have complex health conditions which can increase the risk for COVID-19 and complicate their plans for safety. And there's also less likely um, to have disposable income as well as less likely to have the option to work from home. And other things such as immigration status being a barrier to receive stimulus checks, for example. So if there's any opportunity, um, to have some sort of income is taken away by um, your immigration status. Next. And so in terms of sexual violence and the pandemic, we know that sexual violence is still occurring during the COVID-19 pandemic. And in fact, um, sexual violence is often made possible by situations of increased isolation and social marginalization. Um, and here are some of the ways a COVID-19 pandemic is impacting sexual violence. Um, the Learning Network had a really great infographic that's on this slide um, that shows the different ways that sexual violence um, is happening. But some of the consequences of that um, for the victim survivor is the reluctance to go to the hospital um, or access other services, out of fear of exposure to COVID-19. And that's real for other people as well. And having shame and fear of repercussions um, for disclosing if the sexual violence occurred while disobeying social and physical distancing mandates, um, having scheduled changes to public in transportation um, services, which limits the ability to access support systems. Next. So I came across this infographic um, by Peterson et al, um, which was published last month. And what I like about this is um, it, they were able to identify at least nine ways in which the consequences and responses to pandemics like COVID-19 can lead to um, an increase in violence against women and children. I mean, we could have a whole conversation about just this infographic. Um, but I wanted to draw your attention to specific ones that might not be as intuitive. Um, so the virus specific sources of violence, um, number six, so thinking about how the pandemic has already documented ways that perpetrators are using virus specific misinformation and scare tactics as well as controlling behaviors um, to withhold safety items such as face masks. Um, thinking about um, the exposure to violence and coercion in response efforts you know, there have been documented cases of aid workers responsible for assisting vulnerable populations in times of crisis of unfortunately committing acts of violence against women and children. Next. And so some um, recommendations, we have seen that cities around the world have seen a dramatic increase in the demand for social services 
and assistance, especially from people in vulnerable conditions who may not legally qualify for social um, welfare. Meanwhile, we know that social health and legal service providers, such as shelters, food banks, legal aid offices, child care centers, healthcare facilities, and rape crisis centers are overwhelmed and understaffed. Um, some of that was true before the pandemic, but even more so now. Some shelters are full, you know, other shelters have been converted to health facilities. And so we should just assume that gender-based violence is taking place, even if um, there's no reliable data available. I read an article on fewer calls to um, police stations in Michigan. And the author said, you know, that's not necessarily a good thing. It could mean that, you know, they're isolated with their abusers and so not having the private, the privacy to call for help. And so we know that one size fit all um, approaches did not work pre-pandemic and so they will not work throughout this pandemic. So some of the recommendations um, are having humanitarian and similar over, um, organizations um, working on developing locally appropriate processes as gender-based um, service provision is likely to change um, its modality, you know, not going to a physical place for your services. Um, it could be reduced, as we have seen, or operate differently under normal circumstances. We are seeing um, web-based services um, increasing. Um, enhancing the protection and accountability for gender-based violence by strengthening emergency responses, um, providing safe and adapted sheltering solutions for women survivors of gender-based violence, and more important now, as well as alternate social support mechanisms during the lockdown, we are seeing counseling and therapy sessions moving online and more and more, um, and also, important, recognizing the role that livelihood support um, can play in preventing gender-based violence and including some form of cash transfer programs um, for global health, for global-based um, violence um, survivors. And having that as part of um, the planning or the budget for COVID-19 um, related work. Also encouraging virtual support systems um, that includes educators. We are having um, most schools or all schools really moving online and so including that and or co-workers that may have regular access um, to the survivors. Next. And so I came across um, really innovative strategies that are happening right now. Um, I'm sure there are more that um, I don't know of. And so some examples in France, they have pop-up counseling centers in supermarkets that allow victims to get help while they run errands. So this is a really good one, you know, having to go to get um, groceries and so having some kind of intervention space within grocery stores um, is a good one. In Santa Cruz, they have a, a new standard operating procedures for coronavirus response, allowing officers to use alternate arrests for misdemeanor offenses. But what is good about this policy is that it lists 10 exceptions which includes domestic violence offenses and violation of domestic violence restraining orders. So recognizing that it's an issue um, and so that that would be an exception to this alternate arrest that they have. Um, in China, you know, to tackle the increase in um, sexual gender-based violence, cases, survivors and activists and organizations have launched um, a set of actions using social media, which is really powerful at this time, 
to raise awareness and support. Um, I saw um, a social media post um, earlier this week. Um, it's a woman that sells makeup and it's a post asking women in situations that are abusive to message her and ask for a specific type of lipstick. And so if you ask, say, if it's, do you have any more of purple lipstick? And that signals to her that you're in a, an abusive relationship and that you need help. And so she'll ask you, you know, how many do you need? Send me your address so I can mail it to you. And when you send her the address, then she'll call the law enforcement um, in whatever region you are. And so um, innovative strategies like this will be really key. Uh, mask 19, you know, in Spain, women at risk can go to a pharmacy and ask for mask 19. Um, with this, I mean, they're sending an alert to personnel um, at the pharmacy and then protection services will be activated. And so having this kind of innovative strategies um, will be really key um, during this pandemic. Next. And so um, the World Health Organization published recommendations um, to be considered by all sectors of society, um, from governments to international organizations and to civil society organizations. And this is in order to prevent and respond to violence against women and children um, at the onset, during, and after this public health crisis. And they have examples um, that are already taken. So it also considers um, the economic impact of the pandemic, as well as its implication for violence against women and girls in the long term. So I wanted to include this as part of um, this discussion. So thank you. Manala, that was awesome. Um, we are excited um, about this particular component because when you start talking about gender-based violence, I know at Global Health Action we've seen um, scenarios in you know healthcare facilities where um, you know there might be a sort of a national process for how you know the protocols for addressing the needs of um, women and men and and all those impacted by sexual gender-based violence, um, but really when it comes down to interactions person to person, um, sometimes healthcare providers don't believe that, you know, this has actually occurred. And so there's, there's several sort of stigmas, right, associated with GBV. Um, there's a lack of monitoring and evaluation uh, mm -hmm. metrics set up that's really globally accepted um, for GBV. And I think that that, that sort of um, image that you shared um, where they were talking about here are all of the aspects of um, gender-based violence and the pathways to it really emphasize how interconnected this is to just life. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, is there any one particular intervention that is a silver bullet, right? Certainly not. 